Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Accessible EdTech webinar with special guests from Clever. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to share a couple of housekeeping items. Um, just to let you know, the webinar is being recorded, and both the slides and the recording will be sent out over uh, after the webinar is over. Uh, for captions, you have a couple of options. One, the caption link is located in the chat or you can use the Zoom integration for closed captions, which will appear in front of the slide deck. And during the course of the webinar, if you have any questions for our guests, please put them in the Q&A or the chat box, and we will be addressing them at the end of the webinar with about 15 minutes to go. If we don't end up getting to your question, we will follow up later uh, via email, so um, you can rest assured that your question will be answered. All right, um, <clears throat> please allow me to introduce our guests. We have with us today, James Raffel, the head of design at Clever. He is the one who initially initiated the accessibility project. And Anthony Fumagalli, a software engineer at Clever, who was the tech lead for the accessibility project. And my name is Grace Kirkley. I am a marketing analyst here at DQ, and I'll have the pleasure of facilitating this discussion today. On the agenda, we're going to talk to James and Anthony about Clever's business and their users and how accessibility plays into that, um, how they initially got started practicing accessibility and their strategy for implementing accessibility changes, and finally, their reflections on uh, their progress so far and what's in store next. So for those of you who don't know, um, Clever is an education technology or ed tech company that creates single sign-on tools for schools. Their technology has the potential to reach every single person in a school district from students to teachers to administrators. Um, so as we've witnessed, education is certainly becoming more and more digital, um, which has such a great opportunity for advanced learning, but it definitely comes with its own unique challenges too. So, at that, I will kick it over to James and Anthony to tell us more about Clever and the users that they support. Um, thank you, Grace. I'm James. Uh, like she said, I'm the head of design here at Clever, and I've been working on accessibility at Clever um, for uh, the last year or so. Um, just for context, Clever is an education company. We help schools and classrooms deal with the software that they're using in classrooms in K-12 schools. Uh, and one really great way to think about this is imagine that you're a teacher, uh, you have a bunch of third graders in your classroom, and you want to use some really great math software to, with your class to help them learn math. Um, one of the things that could be really hard about that is getting your third graders to have usernames and uh, passwords for all of their different software. Clever helps with that, um, and we're the most widely used single sign-on platform for K-12 education. Uh, we're used in 78,000 schools across the U.S., um, and that's millions of students uh, and teachers who are using us to help with their technology needs. In terms of accessibility, uh, our job is to serve all students and teachers. Uh, we want all students to be able to use the software that's helpful for them to learn. We want all teachers to be able to use the software that is helpful for them to teach. Uh, and if it's not accessible for students and teachers of different abilities, then we're not doing our job. So accessibility, uh, access to learning software should not be limited by ability. Awesome, thank you. Um, so because Clever single sign-on tech is used in, like you said, over 78,000 schools across the country, your technology certainly has a very far and wide reaching impact. Can you tell us a little bit more about how accessibility plays into the technology and how it can impact the people who use it? Yeah, um, for a sense of scale, the way we think about it is that we serve roughly 15 million students um, in the US. And that students, you can imagine them sitting down to their laptop in their classroom accessing a math software or something to help them learn to type or something to help them read. Um, assume that about 14 or 15 percent of those have a disability that might make it hard if we were uh, not helping them with accessibility to access that software. Um, that could be two million students. So it's a really big impact and it's something we take very seriously. Uh, this year, our goal was to roll out accessibility changes to make sure that we were serving all of those students um, by back to school. Back to school is a big deal in education. You can imagine all of those students 
coming to school for the first week of classes in August and September, and we wanted to make sure in 2019 that we were ready to serve all of them. Um, just an anecdote of how well we were able to do that, we've gotten some reports from some of our customers out in the field, uh, district administrator serving technology needs for a, a, a school that had a bunch of folks using screen readers, uh, told us that we had done a great job, that their, their folks with screen readers were able to access the student portal and access their software, and that told us we were doing the right thing. Fantastic. So knowing that the 2019 back to school um, period was a, was a milestone, I'm sure that definitely pushed you to get started on um, making things more accessible for the students that year. Um, I know a challenge that many org organizations face is getting that initial internal buy-in before you can even start remediating. Um, so who in this case needed to get involved in the process and or maybe how did you initially scope it out? Yeah, I think in our case, part of the job was already done in that we had leadership, including the CEO, who was very excited about accessibility and making sure that it was a priority. Uh, I think what was tough for us and what we had to grapple with was a little bit of just how to get started. Um, when we were at the beginning of the project, we didn't know how far away we were from that finish line. We didn't really know what we wanted to do first or how to think about that, and we certainly didn't know how much work it would take. So the buy-in was less about whether we should and more about how should we approach it and, and how big is it gonna be? Um, one way we tackled that was by thinking through our different user types. We have users of all kinds across schools, teachers, students, but also parents, school leadership, technical folks. Uh, it's a very complex product. And when we started thinking about it in terms of different audiences, it became really clear to us that it made sense to start with students. Uh, they're the most numerous of our users. Um, it's the simplest part of our product. We made it simple for them on purpose. Uh, but also their kids. Um, so from an impact perspective, but also from a just getting started perspective, it made sense to make that our first goal. Um, and once we had that discussion and figured out that that's where we we're gonna get started, that buy-in came uh, very naturally. Excellent. I love that you started with the question, what can we do that will make the most impact and not just, you know, how can we just scratch the surface or, or tackle what's easiest? It's really like, you know, you learn by you learn by taking action, and um, you don't necessarily have to be an expert to get started. But um, asking the right questions in the beginning can help kind of focus that. Yep. So knowing that millions of students could be affected by the changes that you make to your platform, this definitely was not a small task to take on. Um, and so, how did you first approach incorporating accessibility into the products themselves, and and who needed to also get involved in that? So once you started remediating, yeah. Yeah, like I said in the beginning, if I, if I go back to the beginning of 2019, part of what we were dealing with was we didn't know what our situation was. Um, there had been some prior accessibility work, we had done some things, but we didn't know how close we were to that finish line. Um, and so the first step was the audit. We worked with DQ to measure our student experience against the WCAG 2.0 standard, that's the one we chose for this audit. Um, and we included automated testing, we included hands-on testing, and that was both for our web product as well as our iOS product. So we just wanted to know how we were doing and get that audit going right away. Um, that was gonna tell us how far we had to go to get to um, accessibility by back to school. In terms of who was involved, um, responsibility was shared. So design uh, kind of led the initial conversations, working with DQ to say, hey, this is a thing we would like to do, but then we pulled in product and engineering, um, the folks who were responsible for our student portal, uh, to work with them to get the audit done. And then when we had our audit and we had our report, we turned over to our friends in engineering and said, okay, how are we gonna figure this out? So once you received the results of the audit, I can imagine that it probably felt pretty overwhelming. You have a list of issues and now you have this question of now what? Um, so how did you take action once you received those initial results and decide where to go from there? Yeah, so um, when James handed me that, uh, that audit and said, you know, like, what are we gonna do about this? It definitely was intimidating. You're looking at this spreadsheet with several hundred line items that are uh, you know, telling you these things that are you know, ranging from minor to major issues within this portal. And I didn't necessarily have a lot of technical context on like, why is this an issue, how to resolve it, et cetera. Um, 
So the first step we really took was uh, sort of auditing the audit. Um, when you really dive into some of these line items, at least uh, when you evaluate it with knowledge of how the tech stack actually works, uh, it's really not 400 individual tasks. Um, it really turned out to be more like 30 to 50. Um, and part of the reason for that is uh, some of the work that we had already done um, to improve ourselves in that realm. Um, one particular example is uh, at Clever, a lot of our front end components are organized into a component library. So when someone uses a text input, for example, uh, on Clever, it's the same code uh, backing every single one of those text inputs. So there's, you know, there might be a dozen text inputs in the portal that all have the same accessibility problem, but you fix it in one place and you remove 12 items from the audit that way. Um, so that was the sort of the initial approach was just figuring out what are the consolidated changes that we can make. Right, absolutely. So doing that like further layer of organization kind of made the list smaller in a way. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Awesome. And Anthony, as, as an engineer, how were you able to gain support internally from your teams to carry out the development work that was needed for these accessibility changes? Yeah, so um, at Clever, we have this uh, great strategy of anytime there's uh, you know, additional work that you're asking people to do or like maybe a meeting that no one really wants to go to, uh, you rebrand it and call it a party. Uh, so we did, hosted uh, with the engineering team uh, weekly accessibility parties where the team would get together, we'd have snacks, and uh, people would just pick out a task from the uh, pool of accessibility tasks and have uh, an hour, two hours to just work on that, uh, just that task rather than normal sprint work. Um, what that, what that provided was not only the chunk of time that was needed to actually like dedicate to that task, but it also like provided a regular cadence to make sure that those tasks were getting picked up. And because the whole team was together, it meant that we were able to you know, talk with each other about it, do some research together on issues, figure out which issues were similar to each other. Maybe there was a very similar fix that needed to be done in two different places and we're able to tackle those uh, in parallel. Um, so just carving up that time was really important. Uh, and I think it also helped us stay accountable. You know, you pick up a task, you've assigned it to yourself. Uh, there's an amount of responsibility that you feel to get that done, even if it extends beyond the you know, allocated hour or two that we have for it. So that proved to be really effective. I love the idea of accessibility parties and that that you can take this time, carve it out, that it's uh, dedicated time to doing accessibility and it's collaborative. You can work through things together. You can learn together. Um, I feel like that's a, that's a great way to motivate people and definitely free snacks are, are a big plus. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to take a quick pause right now and remind our listeners to please use the Q&A feature if you have any questions for James and Anthony, and we'll definitely get to them at the uh, last 15 minutes or so of the presentation. Um, so you mentioned that there were hundreds of accessibility issues to fix. Can you dig a little deeper into some of the issues that your team resolved? Absolutely. So. Um... The thing about some of these fixes is that not all of them are necessarily visible to all users. There's some that are just about labeling uh, elements correctly so that screen readers can pick up on the right things that they need to. Uh, some of the more visible ones uh, that we can share. Uh, so one feature we have in the student portal uh, is the ability for uh, users to favorite an application within the portal. And when they favorite an application, that jumps up to the top of their portal and they can you know, access it more easily because it's right there at the top. Uh, and that uh, feature worked by uh, mouse over events. So when you hover over an icon, a little heart would appear and then you can click the heart and it would become favorited. Uh, the issue with relying only on mouse over there was that if you weren't using a mouse, say you were navigating clever using a keyboard, uh, you would never see the heart, meaning you could never favorite uh, an icon. So 
uh, that was one change that we made there. That was one of the more substantial ones where we had to actually uh, make that heart icon uh, become keyboard navigable so that someone going through Clever with just a keyboard could tap over to it and then favorite an icon. Um, another one, uh, this one was uh, pretty common for uh, a number of different areas within the portal was around color contrast. Um, so uh, I think on, yep, on this slide, so on uh, this one, we were looking at that like hint text that pops up over the username field. Um, the previous color, I think it was like white text on a light blue background. And uh, honestly, even it was hard for <laughs> even me to read. So we changed that to a light gray with a dark text um, on top. So uh, these sorts of issues were there are here and there throughout the portal. Um, those really help for folks that have issues seeing certain colors uh, and just overall improves the readability of text on the platform. Yeah, and even just supplying that helper text so people know what to put in the login screen, like, you know, is it your email, is it your, uh, a unique number, I, that's also a great accessibility feature. Um, so in, in sort of light of um, color contrast, um, we know that moving accessibility even further left in the product development process to the design phase is becoming a bigger, bigger initiative because you're able to save even more time and resources um, by addressing accessibility right at the beginning. So James, as a designer, what were some of the takeaways that you had from this process from a design perspective? Yeah, and we definitely had a lot to learn. Um, there were some issues that we kind of came in and already knew about, and we just had to do the, the fixes once they were identified. But we definitely were introduced as a design team to things that we hadn't thought sufficiently about. So on the easier side, I would say, um, just like Anthony was mentioning color contrast issues and other similar uh, visual issues around text. Um, we had a marketing website, so not our core product, but maybe the first thing that our students might see when trying to log in. And, and all over the place, we had either colored text, which did not have great contrast for folks who had visual impairments, uh, text over pictures, which is another issue where that contrast can be really, really low. Um, so we were just really learning as a design team to first of all, know how to test for that, to know how to look for that, but also to just not do some of those things. There are different design approaches than just putting text over a picture. Do it very, very sparingly, very large text, things like that. Um, I think one surprise, an area that I just was not aware of prior to this experience is thinking about um, issues around distraction and animations. So there are a bunch of guidelines around um, these things, mostly for folks who might have uh, cognitive issues or maybe um, attention issues like ADHD, if you have something on your screen, somebody's trying to do work and there's an animation that is looping over and over again, it can be very hard to concentrate and finish the task that you're doing. Uh, we were doing that. Uh, again, on our marketing website, we had a background video. It was adorable. We loved it. It was small children doing cute things in the classroom and logging in, but it never stopped. And we realized that that was an issue. So we had to go back to the drawing board as designers and say, how do we want to convey the information but not use a looping video? Um, the guidelines say basically either stop in five seconds or give the user control, um, depending on what you're trying to do. And we wanted to make sure that we were, uh, we were doing that. And that has helped inform our design since then. We've actually been adding a lot of animation that has been going towards our students. Some really fun stuff for, you know, for the seasons. We had uh, pumpkins falling down as you logged in for, um, you know, for, for uh, October. Uh, but armed with the knowledge that we had through this process and the audit, we were able to do so knowing from the beginning, oh, right, we're going to have to make sure that this ends within five seconds, that it's not too distracting, that folks are going to be able to go on and do their task. Awesome. I love that. Um, and so, James, you mentioned, you know, you had a lot to learn throughout this process. Um, and sometimes that required going back to the drawing board and kind of rethinking things. Um, when you encountered a problem that was particularly difficult and maybe you were spending a lot of time on, what, what kinds of tools or training did you uh, seek out to help you solve that? Yeah, I think the, um, the most helpful thing on the end side was within the um, audit results, uh, each line item um, in that spreadsheet contained um, 
a description of what the issue was, why it was an issue, um, some link to code that um, was helpful in identifying exactly what the location of the problem was, um, but also a link to a, a DQ University resource, uh, which uh, gave us details about, like more details about what the core problem was and why we should care about it. Um, as well as uh, steps to resolution that I think in, in most cases was exactly what we needed. Um, there were a few cases where like the issue was maybe a little trickier, uh, maybe it was harder for us to identify. Uh, and in those cases, we actually were able to hop on to a phone call with a DQ rep and um, get some more details about it. Yeah. Definitely, some of those conversations were about really tricky things. I remember we're still grappling with some some issues around uh, modals and focus states and things like that that are just hard. It's just really helpful to have somebody who has a lot of either design experience or engineering experience or both to walk through how to deal with these things. Right. Great. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's it's so important that um, you know no matter where you are on your accessibility journey, there's always more to know and more to learn. Um, and so knowing to look in the right places is, is a big part of that equation. Um, and, and it also speaks to the fact that accessibility is so collaborative that everybody has a part to play to make it successful, whether you're in development or design or you're a subject matter expert, you know, whoever, whoever it might be. Um, so looking back on what you've accomplished so far and the work that you've done in your student portal this past year, um, what, would, what advice would you give to other organizations who maybe are just starting off or not really sure where to go next from their uh, assessment report? Yeah, um, I think I would actually start back at the beginning, that conversation we had very early on about prioritization and which audiences we were going to try to address first um, and therefore which parts of the product. That was really helpful because it can be super intimidating to get started when you just, you know you have a lot and there's gonna be a lot of work to do. Figuring out what the first meaningful chunk of work will, that will absolutely help a group of users, that's a great way to get started. Um, another advantage that we had going in, um, Anthony mentioned this and I just wanna stress it, is we had already done a lot of work as a design team and as an engineering team to have a design system that we were using consistently throughout the product. Uh, a, a set of um, UI components that went with that design system. Um, we did not know it, but it, that was just a huge advantage in terms of going through and fixing issues and addressing things. And I would strongly recommend that if you were in the other situation where you didn't have a design system you're already using, you didn't have those shared UI components, maybe start there. Um, start building that out and build accessibility in from the beginning because the power of that is going to be much more effective than having to fix hundreds and hundreds of issues as one-offs and then having to do it again uh, in a little while. Yeah. And um, from a technical standpoint, one thing that I didn't anticipate going into the project was um, how many uh, issues we would have um, that were the result of pulling in um, open source third party vendor code. Um, so, you know, as Jane said, we have this design system. A lot of those components are based on open source components. and They're, they're really just those components with custom coats of paint on top of them. A uh, little more than that. But um, a lot of the issues that we got back from the audit were actually um, sourced from that third party code. And it's not that that third party code is bad. It's often just that we were using a version that didn't have an accessibility fix that came in a, a later version of that vendor. So upgrading uh, that version resolved the issue, and it was as simple as that. So um, you know, people are very much in the practice these days of auditing their vendor code for security issues. Uh, I think doing the same for accessibility issues is very worthwhile. Uh, and also just um, you know, taking the time to do it if you have the opportunity before you even pull in a vendor um, auditing it for accessibility, checking out what people are saying about it. Sometimes, um, you know, there were a few cases where the version, the vendor we were using was not accessible, but there was an alternative that was. Uh, so we were able to just swap out um, what library we were using. Excellent. Yeah, I, I think you mentioned this before, but just kind of um, understanding what to look for is part of the equation that once you start 
practicing accessibility, these things start popping up and you're better able to recognize maybe what you need to draw from or what resources to seek out. Yeah. Um, accessibility is definitely a moving target, um, especially when you have, when you're developing a complex product that's also always evolving. Um, can you share with us what might be next up for Clever and uh, its practice of accessibility? Yeah, um, so now that we've done all this great work uh, on the student experience, um, one thing we're really looking at is how do we maintain that work um, and not reintroduce uh, issues that we fixed before or introduce new ones. Um, so we're evaluating some different tools that we might be able to uh, pull into the product to help us um, do that, to, to keep the, the portal at the level of accessibility that we want it to be. Um, and so part of that is tooling and um, things that we can put in the product, but also part of it is training, uh, as you mentioned, just like having the knowledge across the team. Um, so you know, making sure that people know that you know, certain things are in place for reasons and um, to have that awareness as they go on and build new things. Yeah. Um, I would also emphasize training um, both um, ourselves getting more training, there are things that we still don't know, but also the team that worked on accessibility was a small part of Clever and some of our products and we want to spread the things that we've learned throughout the larger organization. So that's work that we would like to do in 2020. Um, there's also more work to do. So in addition to keeping the student experience up to stuff and we are going to be building a lot more great features for students, so we need to make sure that those are accessible. Um, you know, that was our first audience and we want to roll on to and make sure we've done some work, but we'd like to do more work to make sure that the tools we have for our teachers are equally accessible. Um, so that's just a big chunk of work that we'd like to take on in 2020. Um, and as we do that, we're just learning more and more how to, how to just do a great job that all of our products are accessible for folks of all levels of ability. Um, we're working on our design system. I mentioned that a couple of times. We're doing a new push on that. So we need to make sure that we're building in accessibility from the beginning. Um, some of the fixes that we had for this round were maybe a little awkward. They're functional, they work, but they're not the best. And so we have a chance to go back and do something that's a little bit more elegant. Uh, and then finally, and this is something that we've learned at Clever, you know, when you take the sort of remediation approach, you have an existing product, there's something in it that isn't working quite right for somebody maybe because the color contrast is wrong and so it's hard to see or something doesn't work for a screen reader or something like that. I think that's really important, but it's also a baseline. Um, there are things that you can build on purpose to help folks with different abilities. Uh, at Clever, we lucked into one of those. Um, we have a product that we built for a different reason. Um, if you imagine that class of third graders logging in, third graders can often type now imagine a class of kindergartners. Kindergartners can't often type. They are not going to be able to do that. And we have this product that we built for younger kids called Clever Badges. Um, it has a QR code. The kids can show a badge with the QR code to their uh, laptop camera and then be logged in that way under the supervision of their teacher. That's great for little kids, and that's what we built it for. It turns out that it is also great for folks who are older, older students, who might have motor issues that make it hard for them to type or might have cognitive issues that make it hard for them to deal with usernames and passwords. And we have special education teachers all over the country who love Clever Badges for that reason. That gives us a signal that we can think about how to make things that help uh, schools work better um, for folks with all disabilities. So we're really excited. We don't know what that might look like, but we know that there are other opportunities out there to build new things that are going to I love that example. The badges are such a unique um, uh, piece of your product that you've um, shared with me. And I think it just has so much potential. And it's, a, it's yeah, it's just a great example of um, not, of, of being creative and um, proactive with accessibility instead of reactive and having to remediate, like you said. Exactly. <clears throat> Um, well, James and Anthony, thank you so much for your thoughtful comments and your insight into Clever's accessibility journey. It's really exciting to think of the scope of people who use your product and an even greater population who will be using different parts of your product once you um, do more for uh, the teachers and administrators as part of those portals. Um, 
So your and your enthusiasm and drive um, towards making accessibility um, towards doing accessibility is really admirable. So thank you. Thank you. We're, we've been having a lot of fun. Oh yeah. Great. Um, well, now it's time to answer some of your questions. I see a few that have popped in through the Q and A portal. So um, I'll let you continue to put those in, um, and we can start with a couple that are already there. So here, here's a good question on design. Um, how do you balance beautiful, intuitive design with following WCAG standards on the web? Um, this person writes, I find that these often end up coming into conflict or sometimes they're not being an established WCAG pattern to follow. Yeah, um, it's definitely something that we're still grapple, grappling with and learning. And I will give you, I think, an easy example that we've talked about and then maybe some harder examples. Um, let me give you an easy example to, to start with. We had been in the habit of, uh, I think I mentioned it earlier, um, on our marketing website in particular, putting text over pictures. And text over pictures is not always great in terms of accessibility. In fact, I would say there's actually hard to do in an accessible way. Um, if, you, if you really pay attention to the guidelines to get that contrast up, you have to pay a lot of attention to what the photo is and how dark it is and what the contrast it is. And your text is probably going to have to be pretty giant. What we realized, though, was that in changing our design to meet that guideline, we actually made our design better. We had been using that design approach as a little bit of a crutch. And I'm much happier with our, with our marketing website now with less text, less small text, bolder headlines, and using that particular design paradigm sparingly rather than all over the place. So that was a case where we were kind of forced into a discussion to make something accessible, but then we were actually, we thought the result was better than what we had before. Now, let me give you another example where I don't think that's the case yet. And this is going to get a little bit into the weeds, but it is my favorite one and we're still grappling with it. Um, modals, uh, modal windows uh, are something that we use a lot and they can be very tricky with accessibility for a bunch of reasons. Um, one of the issues is figuring out uh, focus state. Ideally, when you're using a screen reader, the initial part of any screen that you're on, including a modal, if that's where you are, uh, has focus so that you can navigate through with your, with your keyboard. Um, and also displays focus. You want to show visually to the screen what element is focused. That helps uh, folks who are, who are using this. And right now, um, our focus states are not the most elegant. And we're, they're being surfaced in ways that we're looking at them internally and going, well, it's accessible, but it doesn't look great. Um, that's a case where we just made the right priority call. Our first thing was to make sure that it was accessible and it was usable, and it doesn't look super elegant right now. There's like a close X that has a focus state on it that doesn't look smashing at the moment. Step one, let's make sure it's accessible because it's most important that it's usable. Uh, however, we're not losing track of it. We have a mission to go figure out a more elegant solution, and we will do that. Um, and I don't know whether that looks like a nicer focus state or a different approach. We'll figure it out, maybe fewer modals. Um, so to me, it's a case of it's not that you can't balance the two. It's just that when you have a trade-off, you should know which is more important. Yeah. Great answer. Thank you. And I just want to share a uh, a uh, note from the chat that says accessibility is beautiful, which we agree. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, here's a question about the audit. Um, it sounds like DQ did your audit. How did you choose a vendor to perform the audit and how often are you scheduling future audits? Both good questions. Um, in our case, we were um, looking for an accessibility vendor. We talked to a few. Um, I went very heavily off of um, some personal recommendations. So I, uh, lucky enough to know other designers who deal with accessibility issues at their organizations. And I talked with a few friends of mine who had worked with vendors and said, who do you trust? Who would be a great partner for us? And we had that pulled us down to a couple of names. And then we had a great initial conversation with DQ where we really liked their approach with the heavy emphasis on training, um, uh, open source tooling, and a couple of other things really stood out. In terms of how often, that's something we're still figuring out. Um, mm -hmm. I, Anthony mentioned internal tooling, so some of it is maybe starting to do some of our own testing so that we can have a more continuous approach. We don't want to be in a situation where we're inaccessible for 11 months and then we do an audit <laughs> every year. 
Um, but I do think it's nice to have uh, somebody from the outside, particularly the hands-on approach, folks using a screen reader um, to do an audit, just as a double check. Um, I think some of the issues that we saw, there's a difference between it just doesn't work at all and maybe your automated test might catch that. And it works, but it's not great. This is like that design thing again. How can we make something that actually feels really comfortable for folks in different situations? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, here, uh, here's a question. Um, you mentioned some good strategies for getting work done with accessibility parties. Um, how did you measure and show your improvement over time with, with those groups? Yeah, so um, I guess a couple of things there. Um, one is we use, we were already using JIRA for um, all of our uh, product management work. Um, so we had an epic within our JIRA board called accessibility of the student portal. Um, and we I just created all the tickets uh, based off that audit of the audit um, in there. And we were looking at JIRA as a feature that lets you look at how you're tracking over time uh, in terms of uh, tasks being opened and closed. Um, so you know, checking in on that regularly, <laughs> making sure you're going downward in terms of number of open tasks was uh, one way. Um, another thing that we already do here um, is uh, the engineering and product teams get together every other week with um, different folks in leadership for what we call kid reviews, keep it demoable reviews. Uh, and so we would have a kid review for the accessibility project every other week. And um, that gave uh, us a chance to hold ourselves accountable to showing progress to those folks in leadership. Um, every at a regular cadence as well. Um, you know, I remember one instance as we were like hard, kind of ramping up on the end when we were about 50% uh, of the way done and I think our VP of engineering challenged me to get us to 75% done by the next kid review. And I was like, all right, yeah, you're, you're joking. But um, <laughs> we actually did it. So um, you know, that sort of regular check-in was, uh, was very valuable. Wonderful. Um, let's see. What are some of the biggest discoveries you have made throughout this process that have changed how you approach new products? I have one. I, I'll take some of that, and maybe you have some others. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is um, having struggled sometimes, and I'll go back to that first question about you know coming up with elegant design solutions, it is a heck of a lot easier to come up with an elegant design solution that is accessible if you're thinking about accessibility in the beginning rather than trying to do it as a patch later once you've already designed something. Um, and so I don't feel that that's like a single lesson. It's more as we learn more things about accessibility, it's easier for us as a design team to ask those questions very early in a project and to think about what we're doing in a way that is gonna support accessibility down the road. I, I, I think we have a lot more learning to do. I don't think we're, um, I think we're a lot better than we were a year ago and I think we have more improvement to do on that front. But that's, to me, my biggest takeaway is just how much easier it is to think about it at the beginning than to try to patch it at the end. Yeah, definitely. Um... A couple of things that come to mind, James, you mentioned uh, focus as a big theme. Um, and you know, one thing that was sort of interesting to me was some of the things that uh, came up were things that we've built to be accessible in the past and uh, maybe some of that knowledge had gotten lost over time. Mm -hmm. um, so the most relevant example, I think, is uh, you mentioned focus trap on, on modals. Uh, is a feature of our modal for accessibility that makes it so that when a modal pops up, your focus is stuck within that modal, um, which is a good thing. Uh, it would be unintuitive to have things in the background become focusable. Um, that focus trap has caused some issues, uh, not so much because of it itself, but because more like misuse or overuse of modals. Um, and there's been discussion amongst engineering like, oh, we should just remove focus trap and it solves that problem. But that introduces the accessibility problem. So um, this project was really great in like making sure that that knowledge becomes known and not beyond just like a couple of individual people. Um, I've seen many discussions where like, oh, we, if we remove the focus trap, then we solve the problem and people jump in now and be like, can't do that. 
for X, Y, Z reasons. So it brings you back to the drawing board and you have to rethink some other things. I think overall for the betterment of the product. Great. And I, in a previous conversation, I remember, um, Anthony, you telling me an, an example of um, how going through this process with DQ kind of helped you and your team relearn some of the own tools and you gave ARIA a labels as an example. Can, do you remember that and can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so um, ARIA labels, for those who don't know, are um, these labels you can apply to HTML elements on a web page that uh, give additional context to a screen reader to the uh, role and purpose of that element. Um, there were a couple of places uh, within the Clever portal where we were uh, sort of misusing ARIA labels. Um, one learning we had from uh, going through this process was that honestly, most of the time you don't need to apply an ARIA label manually. Um, most browsers and elements these days are smart enough that they label themselves appropriately. Um, and in most cases, you should strive to use those sort of uh, natural labels. Um, they already make sense. Uh, so ARIA labels are really when uh, those sorts of situations are not possible. Um, and you, need to, you do need to provide that extra manual context. So um, it was sort of interesting. It's like unexpected, but you, when we go through the audit, you see some issues of like, oh, ARIA label, ARIA label. Most of those were just remove the ARIA label. So it's sort of counterintuitive, but that is what you do to make that work the way it's supposed to. Great. Um, here's another design question. Um, regarding your design system, do you keep some comments information about the component and how the accessibility affects it so that accessibility doesn't get flushed out through the development process? Or how do you document it? I think that's a work in progress. Um, we do have pretty good documentation of our design system. We're going through an overhaul right now on the design side and we'll be pulling an engineer soon. And we've actually been talking through, in general, usability guidance. Um, and I would just say from that perspective that accessibility issues are just a subset of all the usability guidance you should be giving. If you're creating a design system, you should be talking about when and how to use certain elements. And I think that now we are learning how to talk about um, accessibility for those elements at the same time. So I would say for us at the moment, that's less something that we already are doing and more something that we have as a goal for the design team to get better at. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard because there's like, um, I mentioned going through these items and a lot of the issues were in our components themselves. And there were a few cases where you could imagine a um, sort of a long-term fix that makes the issue impossible to reintroduce. Mm -hmm. um, one example would be uh, on a text input, uh, enforcing the use of a label property on that text input. Um, that sounds great. And it's a, that itself is a pretty easy change, but that has a consequence of well, now if there are text inputs within the product that don't have a label, you know, what happens there when the components library is upgraded and you still have these existing text inputs without labels. So um, we had to be pretty thoughtful about how we went about changes like that. I think that was one that we actually did make. Um, so all of our text inputs must have labels per like our own rules. Um, but it wasn't always possible to make that sort of change. So, um, you know, the design team is uh, taking a look now at the design system again. I think this knowledge that we have now will really help inform the next version. And um, you know, maybe we will have more properties that really enforce the accessibility of every component. Thank you. Um, here's a good question. How much of the changes on the student portal will translate to the other portals that you will be working on? Um, yeah. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're not entirely sure. I think that um, to the extent that the changes we made are to those reusable components, they will. That's great. That's just sort of taken care of. Um, I think where we're going to learn, and we just don't know yet because we have, haven't really started that process, is the degree to which um, you know maybe we're using one-off things, or there are just other things that we have to we have to introduce. So, uh, 
it's going to be a little bit of a journey and a voyage, uh, but we will figure it out. Yeah. Teachers have a lot more superpowers and clever than yes. students do, so <laughs> there's a lot more custom work for yeah. uh, the teachers, users than there are for students. Students, I think, almost primarily use those shared components, but teachers have a lot of stuff that's built just for them. Yeah. I think it will be a, a different journey <laughs> for that time. Sure. And looking back, do you have any advice for organizations who are going to start their audit process soon? Kind of touched on this earlier, but. Yeah, I think, I mean, it really does a lot depend on the complexity of your product, how much accessibility work you may or may not have done in the beginning. We definitely were at the, at the stage where some earlier work had been done and that gave us a little bit of a head start. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that thinking about not, it, it, unless your, your product or the thing you're working on is very, very small, you don't have to do it all at once. You can take a bite-sized piece, think about what piece you would prioritize. Maybe it's a particular user type, which is what we did, but you can take a different approach and say, this one flow is the most critical. Let's make sure that this works first. I think that getting something all the way to the finish line and then keeping it there has immense value. Um, and so I do think that there's, there's a little bit of risk about trying to do everything right away. That's the goal. You're going to want to do everything, but figure out a good, meaningful chunk that you know is going to have a great positive impact for a set of users. Start there, and then you can come back and do another pass and another pass. Yeah. And uh, I think I feel like we keep saying this, but really having that design system in yeah. place beforehand will save you a tremendous amount of time. Um, it's uh, anything that you can do uh, before entering like an official audit period, whether that's you know, getting that design system in place or even something as simple as like uh, there are lint rules that you can add to your code to make sure you're not doing like even the most basic things like having images without alt text. Um, getting those sorts of easy uh, wins in first, I think, will help you to focus on the highest impact uh, changes that you can make after you get uh, results back. Yeah. I think one other thing that I might say is that the when you're thinking about an audit and you're thinking about these guidelines we used WCAG, they can feel a little abstract. And I think taking a little bit of time um, to, to really figure out who these changes are for and what their situations are. Um, if you've never seen somebody use a screen reader, there are great YouTube videos where you can watch somebody using a screen reader and get a real a good idea of just what that's like. If you um, haven't used some of the tools that you can use to, to simulate different kinds of color blindness, that can be useful. Anything you can do to kind of get a more concrete idea, I'm definitely thinking like a designer here, just a more concrete idea of what we're actually trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, I think that adds a lot of context and motivation to, um, to your work. Absolutely. And I think the process of fostering that empathy um, really does make a big impact and can, like you said, be an excellent motivator for taking on the work in the first place to, for, to carrying it out to remaining accessible is really thinking about who your end user is that's going to be interacting with your product. Um, so to the point of, um, you know, make, making sure that your student portal remains accessible, that's still something that you have to consider. It's not a one and done kind of deal. Um, are you currently using any tools to help you or do you write any automated tests for, for uh, managing accessibility? Yeah, so I think we're still in the process of evaluating exactly what we want to do there. Um, mm -hmm. I think this will likely be something that uh, comes up as we look into like this new version of our components library. So I think that that's where um, we really can focus and have the most impact towards this. Uh, but I sort of see there's like a couple of different levels to the tooling. Uh, at the most basic level, like I mentioned lint rules earlier, uh, you can, there, there are pretty good lint rules out there for different languages that let you really just do the, the basics. Um, they're not going to get you all the way there because they're really only going to be able to do things like alt text on images. Um, they're not going to be able to do some of the more nuanced things like color contrast. Um, and then a step up from there, uh, there's a lot of extensions that you can sort of run manually uh, on web pages. I know DQ has one that we actually used um, as a tool throughout our, uh, our process here. 
Um, and those will be the ones that can give you some of the more uh, automatable uh, pieces of accessibility knowledge, the color contrast, et cetera. Um, and from there, you can kind of uh, go a little a step further and maybe introduce an accessibility developer library um, that maybe does a check on all of your code to make sure that you're, you're not reintroducing new issues. Uh, much like a, a testing framework would. Uh, and I think uh, the, one, the one caveat to any of this is that it doesn't capture 100% of problems. Um, one of the reasons why I picked out the, uh, the favoriting and the color contrast as the two examples to show today is that um, the color contrast one is one that's pretty easy to detect with an automated tool because tools are pretty, you know, they're set up to be able to you know, see the, uh, that there's a background color and what's the color on top of it and does that contrast meet a certain ratio. Uh, the favoriting one, I don't think a, a tool would really be able to detect. That's one that has to be thought of from a design standpoint at the beginning, from a product standpoint, and from an engineering standpoint. And um, really, you're not going to be able to uh, solve that one with automated tooling. You solve it with critical thinking and challenging your own assumptions about how products work. Yeah, great point. Um, there are a couple of questions about screen reader testing. Um, do you, did you have a specific combination of browsers and screen reader versions that you like to use to do that extra layer of manual testing? So this is something that we relied on DQ to do as part of the audit and the testing. Um, and then we did do, I think we did do a little bit of in-house as well as we were going through issues. Yeah, we primarily used uh, VoiceOver, mm -hmm. which is the built-in screen reader on Mac OS and iOS. Yeah. Um, it seemed like the majority of screen readers were pretty consistent. Um, and there were like very few um, one-off issues that were like specific to a, a type of screen reader. In general, I think if your product is uh, like, designed well in terms of um, the elements you're using and they're, they're labeled appropriately. Um, there, I don't think that there's many uh, screen reader specific problems you run into. Awesome, thank you. Um, one question here about um, getting support internally. I know we talked a little, about, a little bit about this at the beginning of the webinar um, that uh, I think you said your executives were, were pretty on board, but you know a little hesitant when it came to um, you know the scope of the whole project. Um, did you have to you know negotiate internally? Did did you have to kind of fight for this uh, to be able to do accessibility testing? Um, we definitely didn't have to fight. I do think we had to have some discussions. Um, <laughs> I talked about one aspect, which is that I think really helped, which is not trying to, to boil the ocean, picking a, a right. piece of it that's, that, that is high impact. I think another thing that came up is being really clear why you're doing it. There's actually a bunch of reasons to work on accessibility stuff. You might, yeah. be, um, you might be concerned about compliance issues. You might be thinking about a specific user type. You might um, want to do some press about it. I think for us, partly by really thinking about the student experience, which just made it clear that we actually mostly just want to make sure we were serving all of our students once we were thinking about it from that classroom context. Um, happy to, to think about the compliance stuff, happy to think about those other things, but once we framed it internally as this is just the right thing to do, um, for us that was very effective. Yeah, and I think also thinking about the the timeline you have to, to work on this. Um, for the end side, I think it was uh, pretty straightforward to get buy-in on the sort of style of project that we proposed for this, which was like not dedicating one engineer full-time to just accessibility, but uh, to make it a team-wide effort where we spend a couple hours a week working on it. Um, and we had the flexibility to do that because we were looking at a uh, you know, three, four months timeline we have in preparation for the back-to-school season. Um, you know, that maybe is different if you're looking at a shorter timeline, you need to dedicate someone full time to it. Um, but just thinking about what sort of structure you want to uh, give to it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, well, we're almost at the top of the hour. So I'm going to um, let us wrap up now. We've been going for solid 50 plus minutes. So um, James and Anthony, thank you so much again. If we didn't get to your question, we can definitely follow up afterwards.
Um, and please be on the lookout for the slides and recording of this webinar. I hope you all enjoyed it. And again, thank you so much to the Clever team who um, shared with us their accessibility journey. Yeah, and thank you. Um, we're really happy to work with DQ on this. We're really happy to continue learning about accessibility. Um, and yeah, for the audience, if you want to tweet any questions you have for us, we are happy to respond. Um, and yeah, thank you for, for listening. Thank you. Thank you.